And then I'm assuming that your name, Adolfo, was the one on the list, right? I'm assuming that's you. So I'm hoping I'm passing it out to the right person. Okay. Adolfo, Adolfo has many years of experience with SQL Server. His specialty is data um, import as well as uh, SSI uh, with uh, SQL Server data cleansing. He does a lot of that. And um, also visualbasic.net, uh, .net is one of his specialties as well. So we're happy to have him as a solution architect. Uh, one of the aspects of uh, being able to work with SQL Server is the wide range of tools that are available uh, that you need to master and really know to really take, you know, take advantage of it. And one hot area uh, that is uh, quite uh, competitive and then depends on where there's not enough people to do it is uh, SSI, data migration, data manipulation. And so we're happy to have a DOFO on our staff that uh, focuses on just that a lot of times. So we're just waiting for a DOFO to uh, accept the presentation and uh, see a screen and then we'll get started. All right, so um, he's going to, I'm going to recommend you put the uh, presentation in mute. Clicking on the, uh, click and join me, and uh, muting everybody out, and then uh, unmute it when you're ready for the questions and answers, and towards the end of the presentation, I'll go for. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, super, okay. That should be good. So go ahead and mute the audience, because that way you don't, hit, you don't get to hear the kids in the background. and. <laughs> My dog's in the background. And we'll come back to it at the end. I kicked everybody out. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good afternoon. My name is Adolfo Socorro. I'm a solutions architect with IT Impact. And today I'm going to be giving you a quick introduction to full text searching in SQL Server 2012. Um, some people might be asking, why am I not doing 2014? Well, because I think most people will have 2012 or 2008 still, and uh, full text searching features in 2014 are basically the same as in 2012. So if you're using 2014, you're good to go with uh, basically everything you're going to hear tonight. Okay. So let's get started. Okay, here we go. So here's the outline for what I'm going to do. Uh, for those of you who have never seen FTS, um, I'm going to show you quickly what um, what you can do with it with some sample queries. Then I'm going to go into how to install it and configure it, the components that make up FTS, and how we manipulate them for our custom needs. How do we create FTS indexes, which are the tools that allow us to do searches on data. We're going to talk about query and query syntax. And towards the end, uh, perhaps the last 30% of the, of the talk, it's going to be about file stream and file table, which are solutions to the HOO question of where do I store my large objects or documents? Do they go in the Windows file server or do they go in the database? So this file stream and file table are hybrids that allow us to do both. Okay, so uh, FTS allows us to do searching against character-based data char, var char, n char, text, and so on, and particularly var binary max, which is what is typically used to store documents. Okay, so what can you do? And this is a quick overview of, of what uh, FTS can do for you. You can search phrases, or phrases, this is nothing, nothing fantastic there. Uh, you can search for prefixes, for example, uh, fan, well then you can get matches for fantastic and fantasy or local store. You can get locally stored here, prefixes on both uh, terms. And then the good thing comes, uh, inflectional forms. For example, uh, we search for minimize, we will get hits for minimizing or minimize in the British spelling, uh, drive and driving and driven, okay? So you get matches for all of those. Also, we can do proximity searches. For example, if I search, uh, give me all uh, documents where search is near query, so I will get a match for text that goes query to perform search. Okay. Also, we can work with synonyms. Uh, we, 
we can have words that are replaced or search in addition to others. If somebody types folder, then we can tell the search that I also uh, bring matches wherever the term directory appears. And finally, we can do weighted matches. We can Function. search for various terms at the same time and then uh, have some weight more than others and get a ranking for them. Okay. So uh, first look, let's go quickly into uh, some examples <laughs> to get oh, make this uh, more concrete and then we get back to the components and the more formalities and much more examples. Okay. So I'm going to go here to um, SSMS. And I'm going to be working out of the AdventureWorks 2012 database, which everybody probably has. Okay. And in, in this um, database, uh, there's a table I'm going to be working on, which is production.documents. Uh, it's right here in the production schema. Um, and that document is right here. Okay. And let's see what it has. <clears throat> what concerns us, uh, this is for storing documents, of course, titles. <clears throat> File names, the file extensions, if it applies, document summary, which is just plain text, and, the, and a document itself, which is a bar binary map. Okay, so let's see what can we do here. Uh, in this query, which uh, contains special syntax, we're going to search for uh, in the production documents a table. We're going to search in the document summary column for bicycle, and we're going to have it return the title and the document summary. So let's see how that goes. Okay, so we get four match matches, uh, and sure enough, there's bicycle. There's bicycle here towards the end. Okay, so it's a simple search. Just straight, give me exactly our terms, our documents, document summaries that exactly match with bicycle. Okay, we can also search for a phrase, in this case, good repair. Okay, the phrase, one word after the other, exactly like that. Okay, so we get a couple here, a good repair there. Okay. Now, we can also do search on multiple fields at the same time. Before, I was searching only on document summary, but I can also say, okay, search in the title and in document summary, in this case, for the term maintenance. So if you add that. Okay. So notice this first one, document summary is empty, so it matches the title. And also matches the title here, and perhaps in the document summary, too. Okay. We can search for prefixes. And the syntax is an asterisk after the word. <clears throat> so let's search all document summaries for replace and then something towards the end of that. And we would get um, replacement, for example, right here in the second one in the title. Okay. So that's pretty simple. Uh, let's do more sophisticated stuff. Now I want to find all documents, all records with document summary where the word repair appears near the word bicycle, and how near? Within 10 words, or 10 terms. So let's try that. Uh, here we go, let's see, repair and bicycle. Okay, so there's repair and there's bicycle, both of them. There's also an optional term here that I can tell it whether I, I care about the order. So if I said true here, <coughs> no matches, because they're not in that order. They're Bicycle appears first. Let's go back to that. Okay, as you can see, bicycle appears first. Also, I said we can turn words of each other. If I put, okay, I want it very close to each other, no more than two words in between, then no matches. Okay, because there's like five in between those two. Between bicycle and repair. Okay, so that's already more sophisticated than simple searches. Okay, I, contains also have the syntax of form self inflectional, what I mentioned before. So I want to match all the document summaries that have some inflectional form of lubricate. And what would that be? Lubricated, lubrication, all those. So let's see. There we go. Match that title. And also in the document summary, lubricating. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the final one, now I'm going to search in the document itself. Previously, I was searching just the title of the summary. Here, the document is a bar binary max, okay? And I'm going to tell it to go inside the documents and find bicycle. And sure enough, there are even more than before. 
And it's important to know that this table, because this is a requirement for full text searching in documents, has a column that tells the file extension of the document there. Now we're gonna see later on that SQL Server uses what are called filters to extract information out of documents and then pass them to the, to the parser to find the terms. Okay, so that's a quick intro. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so how is FPS like or unlike like? Okay, like you can use to work only on character patterns. There is no inflectional forms, no thesaurus for synonyms, for example. Um, also, you cannot use like to uh, search inside documents, or in this case, bar binary maxes that store documents. And for large amounts of data, FTS is much faster. And this is because for STS, as we will see in a little while, we create indexes. So uh, SQL Server basically takes all those character columns and extracts all the terms, all the words, and puts them in an index. So that's why it's so fast. And uh, where is this available? Basically in all editions of SQL Server and all most versions, at least since uh, SQL Server 2000, and it's available on the Enterprise, BI, Standard Web, and Express with Advanced Services. Although, so it's widely available. Okay, now a little bit about components. How does internally uh, FPS work? Uh, it has uh, at least six components here, there are probably more, but the six main ones. A uh, word breaker that does some parsing, for example, multi-million, it breaks it into multi-million and multi-million to do matches. The stemmer, which we already saw uh, for creating the flexional forms for run, ran, running, and all those. Stop lists, which are for filtering out noise words when we do searching. For example, a, and, by, the, with the stop lists, uh, SQL Server filters those out. Doesn't consider them and does, does not index them. The thesaurus, where we can have synonyms, for example, or replacements. Uh, we're gonna see later on how we can tell us, how we use a thesaurus to make bike and bicycle uh, synonyms and get matches for both. The filters, which I already mentioned, are for uh, doing searches inside documents. They filter out um, the, uh, all the, um, perhaps the binary encodings or other such forms from documents and get the terms out, the words. And property lists, which are new in SQL Server 2012, which allow us to search on the metadata of documents. Documents have, if you do a right-click properties on a document, you can see author, title, and so on, and dates. So in, in 2012, we can now search against those two. Okay. Uh, it supports over 50 languages, and as you can imagine, uh, the word breaker, the stemmers, the stop list, and the thesaurus file are all per language. And we're gonna, get, we're gonna get a look inside uh, those very soon. <clears throat> okay, so how do we set this up? How do we install? This is a screenshot of my computer. Uh, you would have a checkbox uh, next to what I'm uh, highlighting there, the full text search and semantic extractions, and you uh, would click that and proceed to install it. If you don't have it already, if your screen on the installation shows like this, you already have it. Uh, and how did I get there? Um, let me show you. If you go to the SQL Server folder, in my case 2012 here, and you go to configuration and then to the installation center, um, I'm not going to do it because it's going to take a while doing checks and other things, but this is the way you go. Installation, and then when you get, you get to a screen like this where you check off the components you want. In my case, I have, I, I'm showing here two uh, editions of SQL Server 2012 that I have installed. If you only have one, then you can just gonna show half of the screen. Okay, so after you have that, I'm just gonna show you that there's a default language uh, and this goes in the server properties. Let me go back to SSMS, show you that screen. And it's, uh, if I do right click on the server itself, properties, and here's the file full text search uh, default language. 1033 is English, American English in this case. Now you've probably seen in, in your C program files, you might, might see uh, 
uh, Microsoft installations with folders with numbers like this. If you use English, you'll see this, and that's the, the ID for the English language. Um, okay, so indexing. That's how FTS works. We create an index over a table or an index view, and we can only have one. And that index or that table must have a unique single column non nullable index on it. So we're going we're to do examples of this. And uh, SQL Server organizes indexes inside what are called full text catalogs, and also referred to as containers. So we create indexes and we organize them in catalogs. And what catalogs allow us to do is to manage indexes together. For example, rebuilds of indexes. So we can put them in a catalog or separate catalogs if we have several, and we can rebuild them in a different schedules, for example. It's just a logical construct. And another important concept is the population of the index. You can imagine if you have a large table, and perhaps you have a lot of documents and you want to do FTS on it, and you're going to create an index, then you have to be careful about how the index is populated. You're doing it uh, during business hours and you have a lot of users and a lot of data in that table and you do an automatic population that's gonna uh, clog the machine maybe. So you have to be on the server, you have to be careful with that. That's why we have the options of doing it automatic at the moment where we create the index, or we can also do it manually by hand or we can schedule it. We can have it perhaps at off hours, um, the index being rebuilt or the new items added to the, to the table are uh, being included in the index. Okay. So how do we set it up? We're gonna get to the examples very quick before this becomes too abstract, but we will create a full text catalog. And then for each column in the index for that table, we're gonna indicate the language. And that tells you already that we can have a, a table with co character columns in different languages and we can index them at the same time. And in case we have documents or binary maxes, for example, we have to say what the document type is. The, the PDF is a doc, it's an Excel. Okay. And as I mentioned, at index creation, we can also tell the change tracking mechanism. Populate the index now or populate it later by hand. Okay, I'm gonna do all scripts, but if you wanna do a full text index by hand, right click on the table and then just follow the wizard. So I'm going to do scripts on it. So let's get to that. Let's get to that. Let's go here. Open my example. Break out. Here we go. Have some cleanup code here. Uh, let's use. Okay. So the first thing, let's create the catalog, and I'm going to call it AdventureWorks.ft catalog. Full text catalog. So let me do that. Okay. I probably should do clean up before I do the example. So I have this here. Okay, so let's go ahead. There we go, so I created it. So now, where is it? Let's see, inside AdventureWorks, there's a storage folder. Every database has this. And here we are, full text catalog. And this is the one I created. AdventureWorks ah. already had that one. Okay, so there it is. And right now, there's nothing in it. I can even check the properties. Okay, tables views. Uh, there's nothing there, nothing assigned to the catalog yet, it's empty. Okay. Um, remember I told you before, before we, uh, for creating an, an FTS index on a table, we need to have a unique index. So let's go ahead and create that for the document node column. Let's go back here to the table. There's a document node column. So let's create a unique index on that. And now let's go ahead and create an index. So how does this work? So we're going to create an index on three fields, on three columns, the title, the document summary, and the document itself. The title and document summary are just in bar chart fields. So we just tell uh, the index what language they're in, and 1033 is English. For documents, as I've already said, we have to tell it where is the column that's going to tell me what kind of file is there, the file extension column. In this case, right here, we saw it before, the language 1033. And as I mentioned also, uh, if all these were in different languages, you just give the different language ID, okay? I tell it what index we're gonna use, the one I created before, that's a requirement. And then the change tra tracking for the population, I'm saying auto, oh, no, this is a quite a small table. Uh, it only has like 11 records. So I'm telling you here that create the, create the, populate the index as soon as I create it, 
And if there are any insertions or additions to the table, index them immediately. Okay, so let's do that. Like the index. So now it is indexing. And I can check how, it's, how it is doing. I can uh, query this populate status uh, property. And in this case, already finished. Okay, so zero is idle, it means it's done. Okay, later on, we're gonna see an example where the index creation takes a little while. We're gonna see we get a one back telling us that it's working. Okay, so that's it. We created the index on that. So let's check the catalog. Storage, that's our catalog. And let's see. So there's our index there. And it tells us, uh, gives us that the properties we already uh, gave it in the script. Indexing on document, document summary, and title. And the languages, and the type column. The type column for the one that's by binary max. <clears throat> and these are um, the logical, logical containers, so I can do a rebuild, for example, here, of all the indexes that are, are in there. And let me warn you again, uh, big tables, lots of documents, so be careful when you do this. Okay. So that was it. Created the catalog, made sure I had a unique index on that table, created the index specifying language and the columns, the change tracking, and that's it. We're all set to go. Now let's go back here. And now let's go a little bit uh, uh, with more examples. We already saw contains where we can do precise matches or prefix matches. We saw a near operator, we we'll do proximity. We can also do logical operations. And we can also use inflectional forms, the lubrication example. There's another operator that's called free text that does everything at the same time. Thesaurus and inflection at the same time. Okay, so free text is freer. You get freedom there and not have to specify so much. But with contains, you have more precise control of what you're trying to match. And we also have contains table and free text table. If you recall, at the beginning, I, I mentioned that we can do rankings, assigning weights to the terms. Um, so this is what um, these operators allow us to do that, contains table and the free text table, do ranking. I'm going to do an example of that. So let's go back to queries, we'll do some more examples. You want me to tell them that? Yeah. Uh, All right, let me tell them. You got a question? Is that you, Ben? Yeah. No, I think it's somebody else. What you may want to do is mute the uh, audience. You can do that in your uh, settings there, Adolfo. Okay. And then we'll open it up again once you're finished with the presentation. Let me know if you want me to walk you through it. Okay, yeah. Uh, I do that meeting is open? Is that click? Is that where I click? No, it, uh, you should go to your phone icon in Germany. And I'll bring up a uh, icon there that says uh, mute all. I'm sorry, you said the, the what icon? The phone icon in join me. Oh, the phone icon. Okay, here we go. Join me and then click on mute all to mute the audience. Okay, good. Thank you, Juan. <coughs> Um, so let's do some free texting. We already saw contains before. Con okay, so let's try, let's see what the difference is. Let's try to search the document summary uh, looking for bicycle. And there's nothing there. But remember, bicycle we found before. Okay, so here it is. Bicycle it can find, bicycles it cannot find. So contains is literal just in the plain way. Free text can find it. Free text automatically does all the inflections. Okay. And so it also can find bicycle. We're gonna see exactly how it does that. Okay. Uh, also with multiple words and free text, it's an or search. So in this case, I'm gonna search the title for either repair or bracket. So let's see. Document title, so it matches the first one because it had repair, it matches the second one because it had a bracket. Okay. And the previous example for lubricate, 
in the contains, remember the way we did it with contains, we had to use this keyword in here, forms of inflection. For free text, it's automatic. So if I search using free text there, so there we go. So contains table does rankings, similar to contains, but it does rankings, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna be searching for prefixes of pedal, and I'm gonna rank them. So let's see. So I get a rank back. And note that this rank may vary every time. It's an internal, quite complicated algorithm uh, which says kill server arrives at a rank, okay? So um, I get those two rankings there. If I do another one, and I'm going to do something more complicated, prefixes of pedal or instruction or replacement. So let's try that. It does all at the same time with different rankings here. Okay. Now let's try weight. And this syntax gets a little bit uh, muddy quickly, but you have the scripts to download later and play uh, with them on your own. But in this case, what I'm doing is I'm searching again for pedal instruction and replacement, but I'm assigning weights. 10% to pedal and prefixes, 10% to instruction, and 80% to replacement. <coughs> <coughs> and get those rankings there. <coughs> and I still can hear people. Let's see. I have to mute. That's probably me. Let me mute my microphone. Okay. So how is that difference? Let's let's try a different uh, weight and see how they compare. So let's change the weight here. Put this. Put that there. Compare the rankings. Okay, so we get different rankings in different orders because we change the weights. Okay, moving on. If you want to um, see what SQL Server is doing on the inside, there's this function, this uh, table value function called dm underscore sts underscore parser that's going to tell us what SQL Server does with the term we give it. So, what does it do with lubricate? All right, let's uh, get here. So it just goes back to lubricate. This is similar to contains. What it does with it is just explodes it as lubricate. Well, we can tell it to, hey, give us the inflectional forms. Use a syntax similar to contains. So give me the inflectional forms you have for bicycle. So here we go. So we made a search for bicycle using the inflectional form. The STS engine is going to try to match or will match bicycles, bicycle, bicycles. Bicycles, bicycling, and bicycle itself. Okay. So this is a quick way of understanding what a skill server is doing on the inside. Also, let's try foot. Can you do the the plural? Oh yes, it can. Here we have foot, footing, feet. Okay. And we use free text in this syntax. It gives us all the forms of transaction in this case. <laughs> Plurals and uh, possessives. Okay, so the FTS part so is very useful to understand what's going on if, if something doesn't work the way you expect it to work. Also, we can look on the inside of, a, of the of FTS engine and see how it indexed a document. What keywords did it extract from it? So we use this, um, there are two um, um, table value functions, FTS index keywords by document and FTS index keywords. Uh, so what does it say here? And notice that we tell it the database and we tell it what table we're interested in. So it gives us what are the terms? Here are the terms. Above, absorbing, acceptable, okay? It tells us the column ID and the document ID, which corres would correspond to a row in that table. And that's by document ID. Uh, we were just interested in the terms, not really where they occur in what document, then there's the other function that tells us all that. So we have doubts of how uh, indexing is working. We can use this functions and we can use also use the FTS parser to start figuring out things. Okay, so let's um, get back to the presentation. Increase already. Okay, let's talk about the components that are make all this possible. One is the stop list, which is uh, 
a list of words that are considered noise, okay, and that are discarded and are not considered in the search or in the matching. So in English, A is the, by, and, and a bunch of others. And there's a system stop list, and we can also have our own stop list, and even vary stop lists per index. Okay. Um, the other component is the thesaurus, and this can have a, a bunch of applications. Thesaurus uh, gives us two options. We can uh, have synonyms and we can have replacements. For example, if we're doing searching on names in our application, we can tell it that rubber and Bob are the same and match um, both equally. We can um, take care of common misspellings, calendar and calendar, and get matches for those, or homophones, like um, words that are spelled differently but sound the same, technical terms like proc and procedure. And this is particularly powerful if your application logs the searches the users make, and you, you try to learn from them, and then use the thesaurus to guide or to amplify what FTA is matching. So as I said, uh, thesaurus is one per language, and we get expansions, bike in addition to bicycle, for example, and replacements, okay? If somebody types calendar, then forget that and use calendar, the correct uh, spelling. And filters, which are the components that allow us to search inside documents, they extract the textual information from the document, remove the formatting, that's why they have to be particular to the document type, and then it sends uh, the text to the word breaker and the thesaurus and all the other components that do the actual matching, okay? And interestingly enough, by default, uh, SQL Server does not include the Office 2010 and the PDF filters. So it includes doc and XLS, but doesn't include docx, for example, all those new ones. So those you have to download and install yourself, also PDF. And in the end of the presentation, I have a slide that gives you the uh, URLs for where you can download that. So let's look at a little bit at components on the inside. Let's go back to SSMS. Okay, um, components here. So first, what languages are there? There's this uh, function we can use, or uh, table we can look at, and then 50 or something languages here. The gray to see what's available. And the stop list, like I said, there's a system stop list, and there's also a stop list I can uh, build on my own. So let's check out what does the system stop list have for English. Let's try 1033 English. Let's see what's there. So it tells me the language and this, the numbers on their own, the letters on their own, and then all these words. And there's uh, 154 of them. Stuff I don't or won't that won't be cared about when searching, okay. I wanna create my own stop list. I can use this syntax. And what I'm doing here, I'm saying, okay, create it, uh, but I wanna start out with whatever is in the system stop list. So let's do that. Let's create it. And I can see what stop list I have. So it's just that one that I just created. Where else can I see it? In storage here, full stack stop list, there it is. Okay. You can have many, uh, as many as you want, because you can have different ones for different indexes. And I already did, we saw this before, but now I'm looking into my stop list. The one I just created, just a copy of the English one. So everything's there as before. To add new words, I can either use this syntax, okay, or I can go here to the GUI and then add new words. Okay, thesaurus, one per language, and they are in this folder here. They're XML files. In my machine, they are here, so let's go there and look at the, the files. Okay, here we are, and it's the, the naming convention is TS and then an abbreviation for the language. And I just know that E and U is English, so let's see what that looks like. Let's open it with Visual Studio. <coughs> Initially, there's nothing in the thesaurus, so if you want to use it, and, uh, you have to create your own. So we're going to do an example of that. So let's see, they come out like this. They're commented. Okay. So 
So let's undo that. I already have my example here cooked. So expansions, synonyms, and replacements. Okay. So I'm saying here that bicycle and bike are synonyms. And I'm also saying that if somebody types W2K, then I should substitute the engine should substitute that for Windows 2000. And another synonym here, Robert, is the same thing as Bob. So let me save that. Uh, how do we tell the engine to use it? Okay, not yet. Let's do an example here of how I cannot find bike. Okay, there's nothing with literal bike there, not even the inflections because I'm using free text search, uh, free text keyword. So now let's load that XML file for Tesaurus I just edited. Okay. We run this load Tesaurus file store procedure with the language so I know what to look for. Okay. And let's see. If we use the parser to find the Tesaurus forms of bicycle, then here we go. It knows that bike and bicycle are the same. Okay. Also, let's test our Bob Robert one. Here we go. And try again. Let's try the first query with bike now. Oh, now we get some matches. Bike is nowhere there, but it's a synonym for bicycle, so everything uh, is matching as if it were bicycle. And here's the same, here I use free text for contains, I need to tell it to use a thesaurus, if we turn the same thing. Okay, very useful. And finally, what filters are available? For what documents can I load? and the FTS engine will know about. So here we go. Some familiar ones, these are for user controls, ASPX for pages, C, and then here we are, doc. I have docx because I already loaded it, but if you look at your system, uh, it's a fresh installation, you, you won't see that. You have to install this once yourself. Okay. okay, very good. Let's get back to the presentation. So those were the components. Now let's move on to another topic. And this is probably a discussion everybody has in every application where large objects or documents need to be managed. So do we store them in the database or do we store them in the file system? And there's some pros and cons for which. Database uh, has the, is the more appealing one because if we put our documents in tables, we have transactions and consistency that way. Also, we can do backups of the data and recoverability, point in time recoveries. Also, we can do security integrated in one place. In this case, SQL Server Security to uh, go over our documents. However, the file system is much faster for working with documents or, or files themselves and the performance issue uh, there. For example, for if you want to write a document in a table, it's actually two writes. That's why it's slower. You have to write it to the table itself and then SQL Server is going to log that, so it's going to write it in the log, so automatically it's going to be much slower. So what's the solution? There are two solutions to this. Um, also, if we store it in the database, uh, as we know, we can have full text search over it. So solution number one, file stream, a database file system hybrid. And it's been around uh, SQL Server for a while, okay? And it's an attribute of the bar binary max column. And we're going to see how we do that and allow us to store the blob data in the file system itself. And this gives us too, uh, it lifts the restriction of the two gigabyte limit that is SQL Server imposes on, on this kind of columns. We're not limited by that anymore. Also, the SQL Server buffer pool is not used when transacting with these objects. If we do a, a regular SQL Server queries and transactions, the buffer pool, which is the, the memory that SQL Server uses to operate, uh, is going to have to store these objects that are quite large. And we know that SQL Server loves memory and operates better. If that uh, buffer pool is available for caching. Um, so if we put all these objects there or make it um, uh, put the objects there, it's going to be much lower. And with file stream, um, all the isolation semantics um, for transactions are gonna be available for us. So how do we do this, this hybrid? How do we set it up? Uh, some steps here, quite simple, and some of them you only do one time. You have to enable it at the operating system level through the configuration manager. I'm gonna do an example very soon. 
You have to configure it at the instance level. Then we create a file group, and then we add files to that file group, to a special file stream file group. And in that file group, we're going to tell what the root folder is where the files are going to be put. Okay. So let's do that. Let's see how that works. OK, so how do we enable it at the OS level? We have to go to the Configuration Manager, and that you access. You go to SQL Server 2012 here, Configuration Tools, uh, Configuration Manager. A bunch of things here, because I have like four editions of SQL Server installed, but I locate the one I'm using now, which is the Enterprise. Right-click, Properties, and there's a tab for File Stream, and we just have to check that. So yeah, I'm enable it for Transact SQL Server, for IO access, file access, I'm gonna explain later on what, why we need that. And also I'm gonna explain what this Windows share name does. Okay. But in the meantime, just know that you have to go here and enable file stream. Next step is we have to enable it at the uh, instance level. And we have three options. You type disable, you transact a SQL access enable or the full access enable. So let's see where we do that. So instance level, I should go here, now instance, properties, and um, here we go to advanced and file stream, here we are. Full access means, and we're going to cover this a little bit more later, that I can transact with the objects either to SQL Server or the file system, and transact SQL means that only to SQL Server. Okay. In this case, I'm going to keep the full access enabled. So I did that. So let's do an example. Let's go right into it after we have um, enabled it. So let me close all this. And do that. We go file stream. Okay. So this is a script, a script way of, of enabling what I just did for the transact uh, SQL access enable. I, I actually put full. Okay. So the first thing is to add the file group for the file stream. After this, so let's do that. Let's call it file stream FG, and this is the the key here. Contains file stream. Okay. Oh, I already have it. Okay, so that's okay. Let's see where it is. Created it before. Actually, let's do a cleanup. So, uh, so everybody can see how that how that goes. Okay. Okay, I don't have that. Let's do this right here. Okay, I already had removed that. Sorry for a moment. Uh, make sure I have everything clean. Okay. Let's wait a moment. Uh, oh, it comes up. Okay. It's shrinking here. I have to shrink the whole thing first. And it's, um, okay, what should be done? Yeah. Okay, let's go back. It's not liking that. So let's see. Where are my file groups? File groups? Oh, here it is. Okay, I created it already before. File stream FG, and that's my default um, file stream file group. Okay, there it is. Okay, so now I'm going to add a file to that file group. I'm going to give it a logical name called product folders, and I'm going to tell it uh, use this folder for creating, for storing the files. Okay, and we're going to add it there. Okay, so um, that's important here. It's good that we have that message because it cannot exist. That folder cannot exist, and it's there. So let's get rid of it. Okay, so it's not liking that. Um, I should do cleanup first. Let's go back to that. I'm sorry for this. Um, let's make sure. Okay, have it. Let's do this. Five. Okay, for photos. Okay, we just dropped. Uh, it's not empty. And it's not letting me do that. Go back. Five. And there. Two did not turn up. Okay. I was able to do it there. It's not empty. Let's go back to that. I'm going to show you how it ends up. Okay. 
So let's see. Um, what I did here is I created a copy of the table that already exists in AdventureWorks, which is called uh, Production Product Photos, this one. Okay. And this table has two bar binary max uh, columns, thumbnail photo and large photo. I created a copy of that, which is this create statement here, but instead of just bar binary max, I added the attribute file stream to tell it that this column and this column are now gonna be stored with the file stream. Okay. And after that, I copied that day one data, the data from the product photo into my new one, product photo file stream. So, so it's all there after I created it. Okay, I load it in an insert tool. Okay. And I can work with it just as if it were, um, oh, it switched database here. Just as if it were a regular table, everything's there. Okay. Behind the scenes, what happens is when I created the file group and I told her, or oh, use this folder to store the objects, we created it. You see here, AW products. It has a log here for logging. Remember, this is all transactional. So it's creating uh, some support files for the logging and recovery. And then for each table that has a file stream column, it's gonna create a folder, which is on, on the struggle, we'll do it here. And then inside that, it's gonna be a data, but first, it's gonna store it, it's gonna create subfolders for each column. So instance, in this table, I have two file stream columns, it creates two folders. And then inside that, it puts the files. One folder, two folders. Notice here, and this is very important, this file names, these files have no intelligible file names and they don't have suffixes either. Okay. However, I know they're images, so I know I can open them with paint. So let's try that. Here we go, that's a bike. Okay. But in general, um, they say on the other hand, never touch these files. This is not meant to be worked on directly, not with file stream. You try to edit here this uh, in some way or remove the files, it's gonna create chaos in the database. Okay. So never do that. It's supposed to be transacted, and I'm going to touch up on that uh, very soon. Okay, so let's go back. File stream. Okay. So as I said, all access must be transactional. And here, and this is uh, one of the um, downsides of file stream, you have to use specific APIs for the file I.O. That's why you should never edit those files directly or touch them in any way. Okay, everything, has, if you go through SQL Server, you can do regular T-SQL, but if you want to work with larger files and two gigabytes to um, exceed the, the regular limit of SQL Server, then you have to use specific APIs. Also for applications, you have to use specific APIs to deal with the files in there. You cannot just operate on files directly as you would. Okay? And that's one of the downsides of this. We're going to see how we get over that. When to use it? Uh, a few years ago, Microsoft uh, published a, a paper that they studied uh, where's the cutoff point where you should decide what goes in the, in the file system and what goes in the database. And basically, if your objects are larger than one megabyte, they should go in the file system. Smaller objects, you can store them in the database and uh, your performance will be just fine. Also, you said if you, if you care about um, Fast access, like I mentioned before, uh, the objects through the database have to be written in two places, tables and the log. And um, okay, so that's the sound. Good thing, they're outside the, the database. Also, since they're in separate file groups, we can have a separate um, a backup uh, logic for the database. We might decide to uh, back up the file group separately. Perhaps uh, the transactional tables, the regular ones, we might uh, back up uh, at shorter intervals than file stream file groups. So that, that's one benefit there of, putting, of them being in a separate file group. So what's the answer for this downside about uh, the files and the file names and that I cannot go directly to the folder and do stuff with the files? Or file tables. And these are new with SQL Server 2012. And there are a special kind of fixed schema table. And it's all built on top of the file stream capabilities. And they allow us to store files and documents as if they were in the database, but they're really in, the, in a folder 
but then we can use the Win32 API to access them. And we're going to see that we're going to be able to uh, look at where the files are uh, just as a regular uh, Windows folder. Okay. Also, file tables allow for hierarchical namespaces, so folders and subfolders. And these file tables have, and you're going to see very soon, uh, columns that tell us whether it's, uh, a file is a folder, the, the, when it was created, access, and all that. We get the full file names and the access through a file system, of course, non-transactional, okay? So it's good that we can access them directly, but if you worry about transactional access, then you should not do that and use the regular APIs. And the trick is that uh, SQL Server intercepts anything going on uh, in that Windows share with the files and reflects it back in the file table. Okay. So let's go do that, and we're gonna do also uh, full text searching over those file tables. So let's see what it looks like right there. And hopefully it's not going to complain about stuff already being created. So let's see, file tables. And if I have a screen of skip here, okay. make sure I delete this before. Okay, that's good, doesn't exist. Okay, that's good. Okay, so here we go. Make sure we're in adventure works. Okay. And remember we talked about uh, whether we can access the directory or the, the Windows share where the files are gonna be in a, in a direct way or just uh, with uh, Transact SQL. So we can check the status of that um, or the settings for that. And here you can see all databases are off, but my eventual works, as I showed you before, it allows full non-transacted access, meaning I can work with the files directly in the file system. Okay. So let's create a table. And this is a special kind of table so it doesn't follow the regular rules, it has a fixed schema, and they're stored here in this folder uh, within the tables folder in your database. So when you create it, you just say add file table, and you tell it the logical name of where the files are gonna be. I'm gonna explain how then SQL Server creates the logical folder name. So let's just go ahead and create it. And we do that and we refresh here. So here's a file table, my file table. What structure? The stream ID, the unique identifier, the file stream, which is gonna hold my object, and the file type, doc, PDF, or whatever, and that's gonna help me do the, the FTS index later on. And then some um, administrative information. Is it a directory? Is it read-only? And all these columns are gonna be maintained uh, by SQL Server. So what is the name that it's, that SQL Server is gonna give this share folder, okay? In my case, this is the, the name. How does it come up with that? The machine name, the instant level file stream share, which I called, I already said before, this is FS root, okay? The database uh, level directory and the file table directory, which I named here when I created the file table. So my name is all this. So let's see if that's, if that's true. So let's go there. There we go. It's empty. So it's all share. Okay. So, and we can query this table just like any table. So let's see what's in there. Well, there's nothing. Now I have two options of, of, for loading data there. I can go the manual way, um, bulk insert or whatever directly to transact SQL, or I can do it through the file system. All drag and drop. So let's Try to do that. I have some sample files. Um, let's go here. So I have four files. Everything uh, on top. Uh, these are SQL Server documents, PDF and DocX. I have four files here, two directories, and within each directory, I have a couple files. So, um, so let's drag and drop. That's copied, so what's in my file table now? Well, here you go. They, they were intercepted and now everything's in there already. So the name of the file, some path 